I will tell you, Director Deutsch, as a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. Juan Pablo Escobar, the son of drug trafficker Pablo Escobar, recently told an Argentine news website his father worked with the CIA. Escobar said his father worked with the CIA selling cocaine to finance a fight against communism in Central America. There are names like George Bush Sr. and so many more, he told the online newspaper. It's hardly a secret the agency is involved in the trafficking of narcotics. In 1993, the establishment media reported on a special Venezuelan anti-drug unit funded by the CIA. It smuggled more than 2,000 pounds of cocaine into the United States with the knowledge of CIA officials, despite protests by the Drug Enforcement Administration. The CIA's involvement in the drug trade goes back to the creation of the agency in the late 1940s. The CIA funded and armed the Corsican Mafia and supported its effort to break up labor strikes in France. The Corsican Mafia in turn used CIA support to establish the French connection. It oversaw the smuggling of heroin from Turkey to France and then America. In the 1950s, the CIA supported the Nationalist Chinese Army, known as the KMT. After the KMT failed to draw Chinese troops away from the Korean front and invaded and occupied Burma, the KMT imposed a tax on Burmese farmers growing opium. Members of the Burmese military later said opium was flown out of the country on unmarked CIA C-47s. In the 1960s and early 70s, the CIA worked with the Hmong tribe in Laos to fight against communists in the region. The U.S. convinced them to grow opium instead of rice. The CIA went so far as to establish a heroin refinery at its headquarters in the country and flew processed drugs out using Air America, the agency's air force operating undercover as a passenger and cargo airliner. By the 1980s, opium production shifted from the Golden Triangle to the Golden Crescent in Afghanistan. The CIA had worked with the Afghan Mujahideen since 1979, when President Carter signed off on a covert war against the Soviet Union. Opium sales were used to fund the Mujahideen, which would later become Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. At the same time, the CIA used drug profits to fund the Contras, a proxy army fighting to overthrow the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. Congress had passed the Bolin Amendment, forbidding direct funding of the Contras, and the CIA devised a scheme to fund the proxy war by selling arms to Iran. The weapons were flown to Latin America by CIA-protected smugglers and returned to the states loaded with Medellin cartel cocaine. A money launderer from the cartel told Congress in 1988 he worked with the CIA, but this was ignored by the New York Times and the Washington Post. Instead of mentioning the CIA connection, the newspapers reported instead on Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega's involvement in the drug trade. Noriega also opposed the Contra proxy war in neighboring Nicaragua. That uh, George or the CIA has given the Noriega over the years two hundred thousand dollars a year. Oh yes. And uh, they kept feeding him money, even 
when uh, Bush was the head of the CIA. Mm. I think uh, George Bush is uh, deep into it, well over his head. Somebody asked me once of, uh, if I thought George Bush knew about as much what's going on as, as Ronald Reagan, I think George Bush knew a lot more about what was happening in the CIA because I think uh, Reagan was probably more removed from it, uh, I mean, just by his own personality and maybe his age or something. Uh, but I think George Bush, through his office and through the, and through the fact that he was a member of this, you know, head of the CIA, I think he was very, very close to it. He knows exactly what was happening. And I believe the rule that once a CIA member, always a CIA member. In 1989, President Bush authorized an invasion of Panama to remove Noriega and bring him up on drug charges in the United States. Thousands of innocent civilians were killed during the invasion. In 1996, the journalist Gary Webb published a series called Dark Alliance that uncovered the connection between the CIA and violent Los Angeles drug gangs. The Crips and Blood sold tons of cocaine and fueled one of the worst drug epidemics in U.S. history. The drug network opened a direct line between the Colombian cartels and black neighborhoods in L.A. Profits from the sales were used to fund the Contras. Gary Webb was targeted by the CIA and was demoted by the San Jose Mercury News. He resigned from the newspaper and published Dark Alliance, the CIA, the Contras, and the crack cocaine explosion. Tell us, uh, you know, in a, a couple of minutes, what this is about. It's about a, it's about a drug ring that operated in uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles in the mid '80s, and um, it was it was connected to a Nicaraguan uh, anti-communist army called the FDN, which was one of the biggest groups that we know as the Contras. And it was uh, selling cocaine um, in Los Angeles, for the most part, but in other areas of the country as well, um, to, to the gangs, to the Crips and Bloods uh, down, in Los, down in South Central Los Angeles. And they were taking the money and using some of it, um, I don't know how much, we haven't figured that out yet, uh, to, to buy weapons for the Contras, um, and you know, I know, I know it sounds, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds like the wildest conspiracy theories, uh, which is why all our supporting documentation for the thing is posted on the internet. And if anybody's interested, I can give you the internet address a little later on. Yeah, um, we've got a uh, from the Mercury News here a, a big chart that you put together from the Sunday story. Did you write all this, by the way? Yes, I did. This is a chart that shows how the the money left down around Columbia, and uh, can you give us a little bit of this scenario uh, on how these? I'm not looking at a television right now, but I, I, is that the pipeline chart? It is. Uh, yeah, those were the various smuggling routes that the that the ring used, um, starting in the late '70s up to the early '90s, um, to get the cocaine into the country and to get the money, some of the money back out of the country. In 1996, CIA Director John Deutsch went to Los Angeles to attempt to refute the allegations raised by the Webb articles and was confronted by Michael Rupert, who testified that he had witnessed CIA involvement in flooding Los Angeles with deadly drugs. Director Deutsch, I will refer you to three specific agency operations known as Amadeus, Pegasus, and Watchtower. I have Watchtower documents heavily redacted by the agency. I was personally exposed to CIA operations and recruited by CIA personnel who attempted to recruit me in the late 70s to become involved in protecting agency drug operations in this country. I have been trying to get this out for 18 years and I have the evidence. My question for you is very specific, sir. If in the course of the IG's investigations and Fred Hitz's work, you come across evidence of severely criminal activity let him speak into and it's mind. classified. Will you use that classification to hide the criminal activity, or will you tell the American people the truth? All right, you want to hear the response first from Congressman Julian Dixon and then from the director? Wait, wait a minute from your from your, I'm sorry, sir, I will allow the director to speak first and then Congressman Julian Dixon. If you have information about CIA illegal activity 
in drugs, you should immediately bring that information to wherever you want, but let me suggest three places. The Los Angeles Police Department. <laughs> I'm, if I, I'm if sorry, I, others want to hear this answer. I am sorry, others want to hear this answer. It, it, it is your choice, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Inspector General, or uh, Office of one of your Congress uh, persons from this... Less than a decade later, Webb was found dead. The Sacramento County Coroner's Office ruled the death a suicide, despite the fact he was shot twice in the head. For more than 30 years, the big banks have been key players in the international drug trade, including Bank of America, Western Union, and J.P. Morgan. The extent of this involvement was revealed in 2010, when Wachovia cut a deal with the U.S. government, which involved the bank being given fines of $160 million under a deferred prosecution agreement. This was due to Wachovia's heavy involvement in money laundering, moving up to $378.4 billion over several years. Not one banker was prosecuted for the illegal involvement in the drug trade. In July 2012, the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs issued a 339-page report detailing a stunning catalog of criminal behavior by London-based HSBC. The bankers, however, are too big to face serious consequences. Well, similarly to UBS, um, Wachovia has entered into an agreement with the authorities to implement an enhanced anti-money laundering program and in exchange for compliance with that, the prosecutors will not instigate the prosecutorial action. The problem being that the actual bankers, and we must remember it's people, bankers that launder money, not machines, not actually um, the paper itself, it's the actions of individuals that launder the money. Nobody's held accountable, and I said recently at a conference in Miami, in effect, the bankers are having a free play at the roulette table using somebody else's money, and in the event that they win, they share in the profits, but when they lose, they walk away from the action with no consequence to their own actions. Illegal drugs play an instrumental role on Wall Street. In 2009, Antonio Maria Costa, who at the time was the executive director of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, exposed that drug money became the main source of liquidity for banks after the 2008 implosion of the financial system. Costa said drug money floated the banks during the financial crisis. He produced evidence cartel money was the only liquid investment capital available during the crisis. Catherine Austin Fitz, the former managing director and member of the board of directors of the Wall Street investment bank Dillon Reed & Company, has devised what she calls the Solari Index to gauge the impact of drugs on society. The Solari Index is the index that I use to describe the well-being of a neighborhood. It's the percent of people in a neighborhood who believe that a child can leave their home go to the nearest place to buy a popsicle, and come home alone safely. It was unthinkable that a child wasn't safe at 48th and Larchwood in West Philadelphia in the 1950s. The Solari Index was 100%, and the Dow Jones Index was probably about 500. Today, it's reversed. The Dow Jones Index is very high at about 10,000, and the Solari Index is at very low in West Philadelphia and very low throughout the United States. And why is that? It's because one of the ways that we've financed the growth of multinational corporations and big banks and the rise of the Dow Jones is by selling narcotics to our children. It's one of the most profitable businesses in America. Escobar's remarks about his father and the CIA were not reported by the New York Times and the Washington Post. 
The newspapers have served as cover for the global elite since the CIA's Operation Mockingbird began in the early 1950s. In 1988, fairness and accuracy in media took the newspapers to task for biased reporting on evidence presented before the Senate Subcommittee on Narcotics, Terrorism, and International Operations, showing the CIA was involved with Escobar's Medellin drug cartel. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and the rest of the establishment propaganda media scream loud about the supposed fake news produced by the alternative media. As the fair story shows, they are not only the real purveyors of fake news, but also criminally complicit in activity by the government and the CIA. For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the NewsBud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from NewsBud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from NewsBud's founder, Sabelle Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at NewsBud.com.